Welcome to chapter seven, part three. In this, um, in this video, we're going to talk about elimination, specifically the bimolecular elimination reaction, it's known as E2. Right, so SN2 was nucleophilic substitution, it was bimolecular. Right, E2 also going to be bimolecular. Right, that's based on the kinetics. So let's talk about just generally what this mechanism looks like. So you have to have a halogen, right? That's your leaving group. And you have to have a hydrogen on a carbon beta to that halogen, right? And instead of a nucleophile, now we are going to have a base. Sometimes it has a charge, sometimes it doesn't but you are going to get that acid-base reaction where we are picking up a proton. At the same time, because this is a concerted reaction, just like SN2 was, these electrons have to go somewhere. So the electrons that were holding the C and H together become your double bond. You can't have five bonds on carbon, so that will push the uh, leaving group off. We'll push the halogen off. So there are three arrows involved. You are picking up the proton, making the double bond, kicking off the leaving group. So this is a proton transfer and loss of leaving group that will leave you with an alkene. That's your main organic product. Um, you will also have your conjugate acid of, of your base as well as your leaving group. All right, now what do we, what we're gonna need is a strong base. We're also gonna talk a little bit about the substrate as well here. All right, so again, it is based on kinetics, that two that we see. Uh, as you notice, both the base and the substrate are involved in the, this mechanistic step, right? Everything's happening at once. You change the amount of base, you will change the rate. You change the amount of alkyl halide, you will change the rate. Both are important. So it's bimolecular. Same reason that your SN2 reaction was bimolecular. <clears throat> now, the substrate, Let's think about what's making a good substrate. Now, in this case, you can't have a methyl alkyl halide, right? You have to at least have two carbons. Uh, but <clears throat> you are going to see uh, where SN2 could not happen on a tertiary alkyl halide. E2 absolutely can. So when we were thinking about... Remember that tertiary alkyl halide, something like this. SN2 was not an option. Well, and that's because your nucleophile couldn't get to this hindered carbon. Well, protons on the alpha carbon are tend to be sticking out more on the outside of the molecule. So E2 is available. So <clears throat> when our hydroxide ion couldn't get to our electrophilic carbon, it could act as a base and do E2 instead. So those hindered substrates are going to prefer elimination, especially if it's SN2, right? Because I'm, I'm sorry, not SN2, I'm sorry. Especially if it's tertiary, since tertiary can't occur on a with an SN2 mechanism, it will go E2. Um, let's see. Now, okay, so we talked about the substrate. Uh, the more sterically hindered ones will tend to go towards elimination. Um, however, primary and secondary can have uh, an elimination, but we will control that through solvent. We'll, we'll see that in a few slides. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, substrate is going to be important. Um, our reagent, it was mentioned earlier, we'll talk about it again, is we need a strong base. 
Um, the only weak bases that you really um, need to steer clear from at the moment are water and alcohol. We will continue to classify our reagents. Uh, but we're going to talk over the next few slides about the product. Right? We know with SN2 there was inversion of stereochemistry, and that was important. With elimination, there is going to be some discussion about uh, the stability of the alkene you form. Now, if you are thinking about stereoisomers, uh, trans alkenes are more stable than cis alkenes. Not by a lot, but but enough to where if there is an option, you are typically going to make the trans, uh, you know, the trans alkene is more stable. It would more likely be your major product. Now, I don't focus much on the cis versus trans product. I do, however, care about the regiochemistry, right? So let's talk about those words. Stereochemistry with double bonds is going to be cis versus trans. Regiochemistry, this is talking about actual placement. It, um, is the double bond between carbon one and two or two and three? All right, so regiochemistry actually becomes a lot more important. And again, we're not going to worry much about cis and trans here. Okay, to discuss regiochemistry, what we need to think about is a substitution pattern. So when we look at a double bond, there are four positions right? And how many of those are hydrogens versus R group will determine stability. So if you have one, two, three, or four makes a difference res uh, respectively, mono, di, tri, and tetra substituted. The more substituted double bond is the more stable alkene, right? More alkyl groups equals more stable. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, let's see. We are not going to worry about cycloalkene um, st stability beyond this. Uh Cyclic alkenes with less than seven carbons in the ring can only exist in the cis conformation. Can't be trans. That has to do with the fact that you still somehow need to be able to reach around and connect. And there's just not enough carbons to make that happen in six member or less rings. Um, this can affect where double bonds can be in bicyclic structures. Uh, that Brett's rule is just referring to, to this phenomenon, right? You can't actually have a double bond here because it would make a trans double bond in a ring that is seven or less. But if you add more carbons and the ring is eight or more, then it's fine. Um, again, I, I'm not going to ask you about this topic, but it does come up in chapter seven there. Where this is really going to affect us and what we are doing in this chapter is the regioselectivity of the E2 mechanism, right? Regioselectivity. So when you have beta hydrogens that could lead to different products. Because think about this starting material. We have a nice tertiary alkyl halide. We have a strong reagent. Now, I want to point this out. NaOET, that is sodium ethoxide. That sodium, that metal, should indicate to you, big, bright, bold letters here, that this is an anion, right? The Na plus is your counter ion. It is, the Na plus is not ever going to be in the product. 
right? Sodium, lithium, uh, potassium. They're just counter ions. It is the minus OET that we are interested in. That is a strong reagent. But there are protons on all of the beta carbons. And these two will lead to the same product. If we remove that, we are going to make a di-substituted alkene, right? There are two R groups on that double bond. Or a tri-substituted alkene, right? So these two products, I'm going to say plus, right, are going to be made, but one is going to be made in greater abundance than the other. So the more substituted alkene product is known as the Zaitsev product. You do need to know that term. The less substituted product is known as the Hoffman product. This is very important to know because you are always going to be asked to predict the major product. So how can we know which one it is? Well, Zaitsev is more stable. So for most bases, the Zaitsev product will dominate. The Zaitsev product will be the major product, right? So in this reaction, you might see both of these as options, but if I ask you what's the major product, I want the Zaitsev product here. I want the more stable, more substituted product. We call this regioselective because they, it makes both regioisomers, right? These are constitutional isomers. They're, the regiochemistry is different. The actual region of the molecule where the double bond exists is different. It is going to make both, right? But it is selective for the Zaitsev product. If it only made the Zaitsev product, we would call that regiospecific. Um, so for instance, when we have our SN2 inversion of stereochemistry, that is stereospecific. It always inverts the stereochemistry. It's not just a major product. In this case, you do get some of both, but it is selective for the more stable Zaitsev product. Now, it can be controlled because what you're going to learn is the organic chemist is a control freak. Great, I can make the Zaitsev product in a greater amount, but what if I want the Hoffman product? I can do that too. I just have to be very thoughtful about my choice of base, right? So my reagent is important. Now, we know it has to be strong. Um, for the bimolecular reactions, SN2 and E2, you need a strong reagent, either strong nucleophile or strong base. So there are different bases that will give different uh, major products, Zaza versus Hoffman. So most of your strong bases, strong bases that will yield Zaitsev products, and that's most of them that we're going to deal with, are going to be smaller, right? The hydroxide, the small alkoxide, so methoxide, uh, ethoxide, these are going to give Zaitsev products. For strong bases that give Hoffman, it's going to be something called a strong bulky base, and that will give you even the more, I'm sorry, the less stable, less substituted Hoffman product. And there is only one bulky base that I require you to know, and that is tert butoxide. Tert butoxide. Now, this may be written as um, T B U O K. Right, that's potassium terbutoxide. Uh, you may see it written, at, you know, drawn out like this. Um, 
the other way might be to put the potassium first and then it would be K O T B U, something like that. You are going to see this bulky base a lot. Notice what happens over here. That's this one right here. Uh, when we have eth oxide, the smaller base, 71% is ZF. When we use the bulky base, it flips almost exactly to 72% Hoffman. There are other bulky bases that work. This is the one I use. Now, why does that flip you over to Hoffman? Well, think about what's happening here. When you have... these options, right? These protons are going to be slightly more sterically hindered because you have this CH3 out here. The protons on the methyl groups are going to be less sterically hindered. So our big bulky base, which may have trouble getting in to make the more stable Zaitsev product, will be much it, it will be much easier for them to pluck off one of these less sterically hindered uh, protons that will lead to the Hoffman product. Uh, st sterically hindered bases are also called non-nucleophilic bases. We'll cover that in a little bit. Are useful in many reactions. This is the one that you are going to see from me. Potassium terp butoxide. Uh, in your reading and in some of your practice, you might run across... Uh, diisopropylamine or triethylamine, also bulky bases that are useful. Again, this is the one that I will test over. So if we were going to predict some major products here, we want to take into account a couple things. Notice that we are just given tertiary alkyl halides right off the bat so that we don't even have to think about, well, is SN2 or E2 going to happen? E2 is the only option if you have a strong reagent, which all of these are, there's no water or alcohols. SN2 is not possible, so it has to be E2. Now, in this case, you also only have hydrogens here and here. So we have to decide, is it going to make the more substituted product or less? Sodium ethoxide is a small base. So we are going to make the more stable Zaitsev product. In this case, right, we have protons kind of all around. Sodium hydroxide is a small base. So again, Zaitsev. But if we want to have that control, we bring in that big old bulky base. We are going to make the Hoffman product as our major product. Um, the stereo selectivity, there are several slides on this. I am not going to ask you to determine this. Um, trans, oh, sorry, trans stereo isomers tend to be more stable than cis. That's a good thing to know. Trans double bond, more stable than a cis double bond. But you would likely make both, right? They're somewhat close in energy, depending on how big the R groups are. Uh, I absolutely am not going to ask you to figure out if it is cis or trans based on wedge or dash drawings. So these next few slides I'm going to skip through fairly quickly because I'm not going to ask you to do this. Not on your homework, not on quizzes, not on exams. All right, so we're not going to worry about rotating and coplanar relationships, except for in rings. I do want to discuss that the E2 mechanism is called anti- Periplanar. It may also be called anticoplanar. And what does that mean? Well, it means that when we think about the hydrogen and the leaving group that are leaving, and we're not going to worry too much about uh, oh everything else. Do do do. Sorry.
There we go. Okay. When this happens, the base is going to take that proton, right? Those uh, electrons are falling in to make the double bond and the bromine is going to leave. The proton that is leaving and the halogen that is leaving need to be anti to one another. All right, so think about those Newman projections. They need to be anti so that, or they need to be fully eclipsed. And the reason for that is they need to be planar so that those P orbitals can line up and you can make your double bond. You get that overlap, that overlapping pi bond. This can be tough to consider when you have single bonds that can fully rotate, but it is easier to see when you are looking at a ring, right? So let's say we have a bromine here and we have protons next to it. I know which proton is going to be taken in an elimination because I know they need to be anti to one another. They can only be anti if they're on opposite sides of the ring. So the base has to take the proton on the opposite side of the ring from the leaving group, All right? Um, and then that'll lead to a one of the a specific isomer, either cis or trans. When it's in a ring, you don't really have to worry about that. So we're not going to practice with the wedges and dashes because I'm not going to ask you anything like that. But we will practice with a couple of. Um, of ring structures over the course of uh, our chapter seven lectures. It is considered stereoselective in this case um, because you can make trans and some cis. I I'm not going to ask you to determine between cis and trans products. Um, this, is, this is just a nice graphic on the difference between specific and selective that I mentioned a little bit ago. Right, selective means that you have a major and minor product. Specific means you are only making one. Right, if it is R versus S, selective means you would have both, but one in a greater abundance. Specific would mean you only make one. That's good vocabulary that you should know. I will use those terms quite a bit. Uh, we we see in the ring here you can use. <laughs> the uh, Newman projections to see how this hydrogen that's going back can be anti to the bromine coming towards you, but the hydrogen coming towards you cannot. And so it is, it affects whether or not elimination can even occur. So both of these molecules, right, these are, uh, they're not even isomers. One has methyl groups, one doesn't. Um, one of these can go through elimination through an E2 mechanism, and one of them can't. Uh, this one has two options of protons that can leave and kick off chlorine. This one on the right does not. There's, since the beta hydrogens <coughs> are wedged, and so is the chlorine, so since they are in the same side, they can't be anti to the chlorine, so they will not undergo E2 elimination. So only this one can if we're comparing these two on this slide. All right, so there's some reasons here now uh, that one product or more than one product might be formed. So when we think about the reaction here, so we have a big bulky uh, T-butyl group. That hydrogen is on the same side as that chlorine, so they can't be anti to each other anyway. But this hydrogen is coming towards us. And so even though we have a small base, NaOME, and Zaitsev would typically be preferred 
in this case, because we have a ring, because it's locked into place, and because E2 is anti-periplanar. Oh, let's try that again. Anti-periplanar, meaning that both of the things that are leaving need to be anti to one another. This is going to be the proton that is removed. That's why we get that Hoffman product. If you have a hydrogen here, now you're going to get both, right? Because it can be anti-periplanar. It's going to be fast. You have a small base. It's going to make the Zaitsev product. It's going to make both, but it is going to make the major Zaitsev product. This is a very specific example of the one time your rules for Zaitsev and Hoffman don't really work out. So my tip to you is to do a lot of practice and to really pay attention when wedges and dashes are given to you. So when you are going to predict the product, when you're drawing them or when you're approaching a multiple choice question like you would see on our exams, um, you want to start going through a mental checklist. Look at your substrate. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? This might lead you to SN2 or E2 right away. You want to look at your reagent. Is it strong or weak? If to be SN2 or E2, it needs to be strong. And then you need to think about your product. If you have a double bond, where is it going to be? What is the regiochemistry? If you are making a new chiral center, you want to think about the stereospecificity. Is it going to be R or is it going to be S? Is it going to be inversion of stereochemistry or not? So you're going to start going through a checklist when you approach these problems. There is going to be a video up on eCampus as well of me working through uh, some problems. I, I recommend you watching all the videos from Chapter 7 before you attempt that. But watch that, watching that video will help you see kind of the process of going to approach this type of a problem. In part four, we will talk about our unimolecular reactions, SM1 and E1. After we get through those, then we will do a bunch of practice. The way chapter seven is, you get a lot of information and you really can't practice too much until you've learned all four mechanisms. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed right now, that's normal. <laughs> um, we will start breaking this down and doing a lot of practice either in at the end of part four or in part five. See you there.